from 3 to 5 p.m. For more information, call 510-481-1804. The Women's Cancer Resource Center is holding a volunteer orientation to help support women with cancer and their loved ones. This will take place on June 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. at 5741 Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. To sign up, call Emily at 510-601-4040, extension 109. The Playback Theater Ensemble present an evening of original improv in which the audience's personal stories are transformed into theater pieces on the spot and enables all to see their lives in new ways and draws us all close together. This will be performed on June 12th at 8 p.m. at the Live Oak Theater at 1301 Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley. Call 510-655-5186 for more information. Wake up, America, and vote for change and converse with Media Benjamin of Global Exchange and Norman Solomon from FAIR and listen to music by David Gans, all to raise money for the Peace Roots Alliance. This event will be on June 18th at 7.30 p.m. at the Sebastopol Community Center at 390 Morris Street in Sebastopol. For more information, call 707-765-0100. Nine, six. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 51, 1929, Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Or fax them to 510-848-3812. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. That's 510-848-6767, extension 621. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Hello, everybody. My name is G, and welcome to the show. I've just come back from Japan, and later on, we're going to hear some CDs from that country, what's up with the music there, and a segment of how music is the new message in Tokyo. And we're going to get, give away lots of tickets, including tickets to see the Tokyo, Tokyo Ska Orchestra that's coming up in San Francisco real soon, and tickets for the Global Sights and Sounds, which is film, workshops, and live music from the South Asian community, including the great Karsh Kale as well as we're going to find out about what's up and what's happening uh, with refugees in the Middle East. Eric Park has a segment on that, plus music calendar and more. But first up, we want to talk about something very special that's coming up, some dance. The San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival is coming up, and Pele is going to be the focus of one of the performances. Pele is the goddess of fire and here to talk about the dance and how this dance will honor her and how Hawaiian traditions are being kept alive. Uh, we have in the studio here uh, Kumuhulu, uh, Kumuhula Master, uh, Kavika Alfiche, and he's the leader of the Hawaiian dance group Halau Aloha Pumehana o Polynesia. And again, they'll be at the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival this weekend, and I want to welcome you here, Kavika. How are we doing? Aloha mai kako. Thanks for having me. You know, I was reading a little bit about what uh, you guys are doing over there at the Halal, which is uh, the group and the center that you have. What, you know, I, I understand that you actually bought the land. You guys actually own the land there, and you're growing uh, traditional Hawaiian um, plants, herbs. And basically, um, the idea being that you need to kind of establish yourself on the land to establish yourself culturally. Is that right? That would that would be a a good guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I know uh you know one of the big movements over the last 20 30 years is the movement to regain the culture that was lost uh in Hawaii. Correct. After uh the United States 
government overthrew uh, Queen Liliuokalani. Illegally overthrew right. the government, yeah. You know, I was wondering if that was one of the things that actually prompted you to actually go and spend all your time and energy to develop the land. And this is in San Francisco, so, you know, it wasn't any easy thing, I don't think, for you no. to do that. And you being in charge of, like, so many classes you guys have, like I was looking at your brochure, you have... Uh, not only hula classes, you have classes in um, language, Hawaiian yeah, language. We have language classes, lay classes, ukulele class. Um, pretty soon we're going to be doing some uh, mea kanu or, or planting classes, learning how to plant these, these different um, uh, greeneries that we use for hula. You know, how did you get involved in this? I mean, how did you get uh, so, I mean, you teach a lot of these classes, if not all of them to some degree. How did you get so committed to it? I think after really realizing what it takes to hula is other than just the physical aspect, but really hula is a um, reflection of our aina, our land, and everything that surrounds us, um, and the way that we look at it as it's the Mother Earth. We have a Sky Father and, and Earth Mother also, and um, our, our job as hula dancers is to reflect that. So how are we to reflect it if we don't even know what it is, or how to work with it, or how to maintain it? Did you uh, go to Hawaii to actually have to learn initially what kind of plants um, are used for what things? And uh, I don't know if you speak Hawaiian, if you speak the language. Is, is that where, did you learn Hawaiian back in the, uh, Hawaii? I think I, 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 I learned growing up very little Hawaiian. Um, Hawaiian wasn't spoken in our household um, and still isn't in my parents' generation, but I, I'm actually learning here. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of teachers here who who speak fluently who had moved from the Big Island over here, um, Kau'i Peralto from um, the East Bay. She's one of our Kumu Olelo, or teachers of, of language. And, um, yeah, I had to learn growing up and even more so now. Um, but the language and the songs are a little bit different from conversational, so I understand more the, the poetic than I do the conversational. You understand the poetic more than the conversational? Yeah. You see it's the opposite way around. Yeah, I think because I grew up singing. Um, mm -hmm. playing these songs I, I can and when I dance you can I can see a whole nother level um, other than speaking I have a hard time mm -hmm. but I'm learning you know I understand uh, I spoke with some other folks here who were uh, from Hawaii and they were giving a workshop about you know what it's meant to lose the culture and mm -hmm. language um, maybe you can give a little bit of background about that as we talk but um, when you were growing up uh, was it taken for granted that Hawaiian that that it sounds like you kind of spoke the language at home mm. and uh did you ever think though or were you ever conscious of the fact that maybe the um, the culture of hawaii was not really that present or you know that it was something that you kind of had to dig for mm -hmm. at that time um, i think growing up because i was actually born here in san francisco um but growing up uh it was it was Something that we kind of did, it wasn't a matter of learning or, when I say growing up in, I mean growing up in Hawaii, I was fortunate to have gone, grown up there also. Um, a lot of the things that, like I was telling you earlier, that I learned growing up, I didn't know I was learning. It was a matter of, it was just a matter of doing, and then it wasn't until later that I realized, well, I, I know these things, these are things that we need to know as Hula people. So, looking back at my family members in Hawaii, I think sometimes, Hawaiian culture is taken for granted because they're there and I'm kind of happy that I was born and raised here because also because I don't take it for granted and I miss it and every time I go home I, I want to learn more and I want to spend time with my elders yeah and I think the elders getting older and everything they're kind of the purveyors of the culture so it's up to your generation I think and folks following you to kind of keep that up because yeah. it's a, a real struggle it's especially. scary right now it's scary it's scary because I'm realizing a whole lot that they they are getting older and, and we're losing so many of them at a very very young age and to be placed in that position um, is a scary thing because I still have so much more to learn uh, I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit, but when the missionaries came to Hawaii, the language and the, the dance was actually banned, so people have had to really struggle to retain their... For many, their, many, many years, yeah. What we know today is just a glimpse of what we had in the past. What is the thing that you most want to learn now that time's passing by, and what, what are those cultural things or those things of your heritage that you want to most learn? I think, if anything, to preserve and to perpetuate um, maybe some of the older songs and dances. Um, I, I 
I'm very comfortable with it, and and as the years go by, I'm, I I seem to um, I seem to latch on to that um, because the more that we look into these old songs and dances, the more we learn about the, a lot of the things that we don't know. And I think ultimately, um, if it's done with an open heart and a right mind, uh, to be pono about it, that we'll be allowed to see a lot more that we aren't mm-hmm. as of right now. Uh, you have the gore there. Um, maybe we can uh, start off by uh, you kind of giving a demonstration or song, a chant with the uh, gourd, and maybe give a little bit of an explanation about it. After, okay. Um, well, I'm gonna do a short. Um, I'll do a. I'll do a shortened version of a song that we're doing at the ethnic dance festival, which is going to be this weekend. Um, and again, our, our songs honor the land. And where my hula comes from is the Big Island, where Pele lives today at a place called Hale Mauma'u at Kilauea. And this song entitled Ayala O Pele. Ay, Ayala O Pele Hawaii. Aya, aya la o play hava i e a ke ha mai la i mau kele e aya la o play hava i e a ke ha mai la i mau kele e uhi uha mai na he ke no me a la i na puna e uhi uha mai na he ke no me a la i na puna e I he a kau a e la i a i e a i ge a la nui a e li a nehi e a i I he a kau a e la i a i e a i ge a la nui a e li a nehi e a i A i na i a mai ka pua na e a No hi i a ka no e i no a e a A i na i a mai ka pua na e a No hi i a ka no e i no a e a e a la e a la e a Wow, um, this is one of the reasons why I love having this show sometimes because you get these kind of moments that are really something. Um, again, uh, this is Apex Express, and we have uh, Kavika Alfice on. He is the leader of the group. Um, the uh, Halau Aloha Pumehana or Polynesia and he's just done a chant to the Hawaiian goddess of fire and creation I believe um, and that the goddess of all vol- volcanic activity all volcanic yeah. activity and creativity is that right? Yeah. or creation? yeah she creates she definitely creates <laughs> yeah I saw her um, create um, when I went out to the Big Island a couple of years ago and I swear to God I've never been so scared of God in my life <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be sacrilegious to you guys out there, but it was something else. It was powerful because, you know, great. she was really uh, active um, out there and mm-hmm. still is. Yeah. Um, that one um, seems like a very fast one. Uh, what what kind of dance goes with it? Uh, the style of dance we do uh, when we do pele dances are called aihaa, which means um, to be close to the ground. Uh, we get our energy from the ground. This is what we learn from our kupuna. And anytime we do pele dances, it's a little bit more bombastic, a little bit more vigorous, um, a little bit more glutteral. <laughs> is there a yeah. reason for that? Because you come straight out from the ground? Yeah, because it takes a lot of energy out to make more land. So we have to emulate that energy in our dance and we utilize all of the forces around us to put that energy up. And our job as dancers is to make people feel that. So we have about 30 dancers who are performing in the festival this weekend and um, hoping that they'll feel just a little something. I had a question because uh, as we were speaking, um, you know, we noted that um, the dances and the chants were outlawed for a while, banned. So how were these chances, chants passed on? Because now there's quite a few people I hear doing them. Uh, I don't assume that they're going to be exactly the same over the years, but how do people keep it alive? Well, our, our language, um, I guess, uh, at least our language from our, from our descendants, um, it was not a written language. It was everything was taught um, verbally, and so all of our songs were were handed down verbally. So we have really, really good. Our, our kupunas, our elders, have really, really good memories, and they were able to memorize chants and songs that, if you were to write them down today, would be about fifty pages in a sitting, um, and so that. 
the songs and the, the music and the hula did get banned for a, a long time, but it still was kept up underground or in the valleys and the outside areas. And it was illegal at one point to, to perform or to do these things publicly, but um, they didn't go into everybody's home and see what they were doing. So they, they, a lot of things were still passed on. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, actually, because those chants seem very difficult to do. I mean, they're fairly long. Some of them are very long. And um, I know that the sound of the words in Hawaiian, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're quite sacred. And so, you know, the pronunciation of the words is important, too. Correct. We have a proverb, an uh, uh, olelo no iao Hawaiian proverb that says, um, elo, e olelo i ke ola, e olelo i and it basically means in word there is life and in word there is death. Oh, forgive me for mispronouncing all these That's words. okay. <laughs> that doesn't literally mean that you say something wrong, you die. That, that idea, I okay. guess. Okay, yeah, yeah, you guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, as you said, have you bought your ukulele here, and I, I can't let you go without playing the ukulele. Uh, what I think we'll do is, as you're setting up, I'm just going to give like a lot of the information out about the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival. Um, I don't know if you... Um, as you're setting up, maybe you want to stand if it's more comfortable where your, your, your voice will be on the upper microphone and, and we can capture the uke with the lower microphone that way and just sit down again. But as you're setting up, I just want to mention to folks that the uh, San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival is happening. Uh, it's happening this weekend. And again, Halal Aloha Pumehana o Polynesia is going to be playing this weekend. Um, we're going to be, um, rather, uh, it's going to be June the 12th and the 13th at the Palace of Fine Arts, and that's 3301 Lion Street in San Francisco. And then uh, the dance festival will continue on June the 19th and 20th, and again on June the 26th and 27th. The Saturday performances are, are at 2 and at 8, and Sunday performances are at 2 o'clock. And if you want to contact World Arts West, please do so to find out much more about this information and all of the wonderful groups that are playing. You can reach them at www.worldartswest.org, and that's all one word, or you can call 415-392-4400. And uh, I think uh, we're almost ready here, uh, Kavika. Um, why don't we just go into the song, or if you want, you can give it an introduction first. I was going to do a song, I uh, was just listening a little bit earlier to, to the fact that uh, we uh, just lost Ray Charles. And um, the song that brings us to the Big Island title, Hole, um, there's part in the song that basically says, Kaileo Nui, your sea, your voice of the sea is so loud. And this place got smothered in lava flow back in the 70s and 80s. And all the beaches that were there before are no longer beaches. They're, they're cliffs and they're lava cliffs. And from afar... You could hear the waves crash and pound into these cliffs, and it it resonates inside of you. Almost feel it before you hear it, and um, this will carry on. Um, I just like to equate that to Ray Charles for all he's done. His voice will carry on, and in our memories. And I want to send this out to the Halal if you're listening. <laughs> No. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Again, wow. yeah, that was uh, Kavika there. He is the leader of the group Halal Aloha Pumehana, who uh, will be performing at the San Francisco Ethnic Dance Festival coming up this weekend. So again, if you want to contact uh, the dance festival to find out about the performances and the times and all of that, please call 415 392 Four zero zero. Excuse me. That's um, why don't we do this? www.worldartswest.org. And uh, uh, Kavika, before we go, I was wondering if you give us a little bit more contact number if people want to contact you and and your uh, Hawaiian Cultural Center as well. Sure. Uh, we have a website. It's www.apop.net, and it has all of the class information. And we're doing lots of different fundraising things. We're trying to raise uh, funds to build a resource center where we can do our research so we don't have to fly home all the time. So you can help us out. Come take a class. Taking a class helps us uh, raise funds for that. And the location is in San Francisco, actually, 423 Baden Avenue, South San Francisco. And uh, the phone number there is 650-589-4066. And I want to thank you so much, uh, Kavika, for taking time out. Uh, I'm sure on your very, very busy schedule because you guys must be right in the middle of a lot of practicing yes. coming up, you know, because yeah. uh, the weekend's coming up and you guys are going to be performing with uh, Ethnic Dance Festival and, you know, they're going to also have people like me for youth as well. And I think you guys are yeah. performing in that. So I want to wish you all real well and, you know, stay in contact with us here at Apex Express. And with that, I want to kind of go out with some music by another local uh, Hawaiian um, musician and chanter Mark Ho'omalu uh, off of his CD call it what you like so let's take a listen Hey te mai o don mot pun apa mai tai tina itu mutai da welo ne ile huam Hey, yeah, hi, kala, undu kapali, ne, kama, kani, hanu, hanu, kon, alo, anaka, ilika, eh, eh, Fauna, kai, eh, walu, ke, ike, ikona, welo, anano, kala, ni, tu, ita, moku, no, lo, lo, kula, ni, kapu. Na, na, ia, do, ali, iko, mili, mili, eh, hawa, ika, ho, o, ili, namo, yo, kikala, unu, hanu, hanu. Oh, oh, eka hili na ike aloha akala hui aho imai o kala ni kauli lua ike anu o ko uau puni ekala ni nana iya Inoa nao lili u ololo kula ni ike kapu You're just listening to Mark Omalu off of his CD called What You Like. So right now we're going to go into a little bit of music of Kosh Kale, and then we're going to go on and do calendar events. Don't forget we're going to be giving some tickets away, so stay tuned. Again, this is Kosh Kale. <laughs>
This is Apex Express 94.1 FM. We're here every Thursday night. This is KPFA, again, 94.1 FM in Berkeley, and 89.3 FM KPFD in Berkeley, and 88.1 FM KFCF in Fresno. And for all you all listening on your computers, hello out there. It's a beautiful night here. I just want to say, if you like Kosh Kale, if you like uh, film, if you like the new South Asian sound that's taking the country by storm, all these folks, including Kashkale and his group Realize, are going to be coming to the Sony Mitrion tomorrow night. Uh, it's going to start off with a film about South Asian underground music and how it came above ground. Uh, we um, are having a situation here where um, we have some tickets to give away, so we got to give them away. So in the next minute or two, I'm going to take the first uh, and second callers for the Global Sights and Sounds, which is going to be tomorrow night, starting at 7.30 at the Sony Mitrion. That's in San Francisco. Um, it's that big shopping building near Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Again, tomorrow night uh, for Global Sights and Sounds. They're going to be live music. We felt Sultana. Um, also, members of the Ali Akbar Khan School of Music are going to be there. We're going to have, uh, they're going to have some people who are be teaching workshops, uh, dance and dol, which is the Indian, uh, folk drumming of the Punjab, workshops on that. And again, Karsh Kale, DJs like Nihal. And it's all for a very good cause. 100% of the proceeds from the door is going to go to Project Ahimsa, which will be using that income to fund music education for impoverished children in India and um, they're going to be, they are supporting teachers right now as well as bringing instruments to the children of uh, cities like Calcutta. So again, it's also going to be a benefit fundraiser. Again, if you're interested, uh, two pairs of tickets to call here, 510-848-4425 is the number, 510-848-4425 and I'll take uh, your calls right now.
everyone. Thank you for listening and for calling in, folks. I also want to say, if you like music from the South Asian massive scene, Damal will be playing a lot of that at Club 6 on June the 19th, which is a Saturday at Club 6. That's 66th Street in San Francisco on the 19th of June, the 19th of June. And they're going to have uh, DJ Jonica and many other folks, Chebby Sabah, who will also be there tomorrow night at Sony Mitrion. And also look out for Damal's new CD. Check it out. Okay. Also, Saturday, June 12th, Aperture is going to have a hip house, hip hop house party, which is to raise funds for their annual Asian Pacific Islander Youth Festival. So if you're interested in going to that, it's at Gavin's Club at 8 p.m. 12, 34, 11th Avenue in San Francisco. And again, that's June the 12th. And by the way, Kearney Street Workshop is accepting applications if you uh, uh, want to be a part of their Aperture Youth Arts Festival. Also, Kearney Street Workshop presents Tuesday, June 6th, Curating Film and Video. And that's a workshop by the curator of the Asian American Film Festival, sponsored by NATA. That's going to be happening June 15th. And for more information, you need to call Kearney Street Workshop, rather contact Kearney Street Workshop to find out the exact address. It is a free event. Kearney Street Workshop's uh, address is www.kearneystreet.org. That's K-E-A-R-N-Y-S-T-R-E-E-T dot O-R-G for that. Also coming up is Mango Mike Presents on Saturday, June 12th, our own Prothop Chatterjee, who's returned from Iraq with footage, which he'll be showing along with filmmaker and performance artist Gino Choi and Kenji Liu. So that's going to be happening at Pusad in Berkeley, 1808 Fifth Street, again in Berkeley. If you'd like more information on this Saturday, June 12th event, Please contact aaopenmic at yahoo.com. That's aaopenmic at yahoo.com. Again, it starts at 8 p.m. Also, if you like Hawaiian music, uh, the great Cyril Payanuhi and Patrick Lindenza will be at uh, Noe Valley Music. That's in San Francisco, and they'll be there June the 19th, 12. Uh, 1020 Sanchez Street in San Francisco. And for more information on that, tickets and all of that, please call 415-454-5238. And again, that's at Noe Valley Music on Saturday, June the 19th, and the show starts at 8.15 p.m. We're going to have a little bit more music, and then we're going to go into some more music from Japan. So stay tuned. Just got back from a trip from Japan, and what you're hearing is by Q Zero. And what he's doing is he's using the taiko, which is a Japanese folk drum, and he's rapping over that. So it sounds a little bit familiar, but a little bit different. So that's a little bit of a taste of the scene, a very vibrant music scene, very vibrant hip-hop scene. Let's listen to this for a bit. It's by DJ Tatsuta and Kreva. It's about uh, three minutes, and then we're going to follow that with a segment I did about the recent changes in Japan and how music is really changing the scene and becoming a real dynamic force in Meguroku and many other places. And then we're going to follow that by another CD that I picked up while in Japan. So let's take a listen to this called Taiko. Yeah. 
しんだぜ、走んだぜ、この罠作品だぜ。脳、yeah! の旅へ発信がきっかけ、たまにフットバックインザデイ。これが完成形だ、太鼓と喋り。ジャパニーズ心の叫び。罠感じなやつのために、風に乗ってこの地の果てによ。飛びな、飛んできな、飛んで今この日本的な、サウンドがお前をロックする気だ。Pretty large base. Well, what was it called? It's called Washington Heights. What was there? I don't know. I don't remember. There was a school there. The sounds walk into a park in Tokyo, Japan. The park area doesn't really bring back a lot of memories for me and my husband, even though we lived here as young kids. Sure, don't remember anything like this. Bands, all kinds of them, line the sidewalks around the Meiji and Yoyogi parks in central Tokyo. Only thing I'm sure of is that back in the day it was very different. After World War II, this park area was part of a U.S. military base that housed many army families during and after the occupation of Japan. Mike talks about the school he went to here. Well, it was called the Tokyo America School, and it was in Meguroku, and it was constructed in 1947 as part of the Washington Heights housing area, located on Yoyogi Field, the former drill grounds for the Imperial Japanese Army. So now, wonder what we'll hear once we get into Yoyogi Park. Well, it's a free reggae festival. On stage, a Japanese band plays Buffalo Soldiers. You know the Bob Marley song about black soldiers fighting for America. Hundreds of people crowd the stage, while around us are booths selling crafts and food from Japanese to Jamaican in flavor. Washington Heights is no more. Replaced instead by stadiums to hold the Olympic Games held in Tokyo in the early 1960s, that event was a turning point for Japan and symbolized a country recovered and renewed from the ashes of war. What year did the Olympics take place? 1964, and the whole area of Washington Heights was、uh, torn down and replaced by. A huge stadium and its grounds for、uh, I don't know for track and field. I think it was. Is that、uh, what you can still see? What we still saw with Yoyogi on that other kind of that large building there? Or is that a something separate from the Olympics? Yeah,、uh, I think the original Olympic stadium has been torn down and replaced by something more modern, including. The NHK, the national television for Japan. And the area surrounding the NHK Plaza has a vibrant life. But Tokyo always has had a vibrant cultural and street life, from the early days of kabuki, now a classic theater art form. To street musicians and vendors calling out their wares, but this 
Is it something new? As we walk away from the reggae performance, all along the sidewalk, at every 15 to 20 feet or so, there's another type of band. There are a cappella groups. Groups with tap dancers taking the place of drummers, acoustic folk, heavy metal, hip-hop, and some groups that I can't quite categorize but mix contemporary sounds and moves with Japanese theater and music styles. This group says that they were featured in a Zatoichi the Blind Swordsman film. Like all good street musicians, their energy and enthusiasm influence me, and I buy their CD. As we retrace our steps out of Yoyogi Park and into Meiji Park, I think that it's hard to believe that there was ever a large extension of an American military base here. The area surrounding the U.S. base in Yokota is still located on the outskirts of Tokyo. Yokota looks like a cleaner version of a parody of a stereotype of a U.S. Army base with signs saying Mama-san this and Papa-san that. I think, what an irony that an area still serving U.S. armed military forces should look so out of place and old-fashioned. I think, it's strange what time will tell as we walk out of the crowds and the music out of Yoyogi and Meiji Parks, formerly known as Washington Heights U.S. Armed Forces Housing Area. This is Jenna Hotta from Tokyo, Japan. Yo 
You're listening to Goosebumps number one. I picked this up when I、uh, was in Japan. Check it out. That's just a taste of some of the great music that's coming out of that country.、Uh, this CD again is called Goosebumps. It's on R and C Japan Limited. And if you wanna, I think they have a.、Uh, I think you can only get it in Japan actually. But、uh, their number is、um, rncjapan.com. I think if you're interested in trying to get them or, or Google them, actually. So again, goosebumps. Next up, we're going to play、uh, a group from Japan. It's called the Tokyo Ska, the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra, and they're going to be coming to San Francisco. So we're going to be crossfading this and getting right into the Ska Paradise Orchestra from Japan, and we're going to be giving away tickets for that. So check it out. Hold on. Also mentioned that this this Saturday night,、uh, Brother K is going to have a Filipino Filipino independent special with uh, reviews, uh, interviews,、uh, including folks from Mindanao and、uh, so much more. You know, you're going to have a lot of good music with Brother K this、uh, Saturday night, I believe it is. And so check it out with that.、Um, again, this is Apex Express 94.1 FM and.、Uh, KPFB in Berkeley and KFC in Fresno. You're listening to the Tokyo Ska Orchestra, and they're going to be here in San Francisco. We have two pairs of tickets to see them, so、uh, they're going to be here Friday, June the 18th. Friday, June the 18th, at、uh, the Independent, and the address is 628 Divisadero in San Francisco. So we have two pairs of tickets to see this group. You're listening now. The Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra, a ten-piece member band that mixes ska, punk, rock, jazz, reggae, everything else like that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to play a little bit more. If you want、um, to hear them, we're going to take callers five and six. Caller five and six, and please call five one zero eight four eight four four two five. We're going to be taking this call after this next piece that was done by Eric Park, producer Eric Park, who followed up with what's happening in the Middle East, including what's happening. In Palestine as well as Iraq, so let's take a listen. Joined on the phone with Elaine Hagopian. She is professor emerita of sociology at Simmons College, and she is also the editor of a new book called "Civil Rights in Peril: The Targeting of Arabs and Muslims" out on Pluto Press. Elaine, I'd like to welcome you to the program. Thank you very much, Eric. And you recently returned from a trip to the Middle East, and I was wondering if you could tell us briefly about why you organized the trip and what well, happened. Actually, I've done、um, cultural and educational tours to the area before, and、uh, always insist on including、uh, people meeting Palestinian refugees in the camps. This particular trip was aimed at those who are much more interested in meeting. Uh, with and understanding the、uh, Palestinian refugee issues、uh, and the difference between their status and situation in Lebanon and in Syria, so they were people who were predominantly non-Arab,、uh, although there were some a、uh, couple of Palestinian Americans、uh, with us, and who have a history of、uh, commitment to refugee issues. Uh, been in sanctuary movements for refugees from Central America,、uh, or are in human rights,、uh, or or have <clears throat> become、uh, very much interested in、uh, Palestinian rights. So they were varied and they were interesting, and they were all ages from 18 to 
So you got to meet Palestinians in refugee camps in the occupied territories and also Palestinians living in Jordan and Syria as well? Uh, no, we actually went only this time to Lebanon and Syria. I didn't go into the occupied uh, territories or to Jordan, which I usually include on my itinerary when I do take a trip with people. But uh, I wanted uh, the group this time to spend enough time in camps uh, getting to know particularly the plight of the refugees in Lebanon. Uh, they are in serious uh, condition health-wise, uh, in terms of the Lebanese government's constriction on them. The Lebanese government does not uh, recognize international humanitarian law as applied to the refugees. So they live in a situation which is, is really subhuman. And they're, uh, they're not allowed to expand housing, so they tend to build upwards on, in very, uh, uh, very flimsy structures. Uh, the men are not allowed to work in a whole variety, uh, 70 professional fields in Lebanon. And consequently, the women try to find jobs uh, as maids, which are now, they're now being replaced by uh, Sri Lankis. Uh, in Syria, and I'll tell you more about that, in Syria, they're treated like Syrians. They have equal rights. The Syrian government works with uh, the United Nations uh, work, uh, Relief and Works Agency and gives the Palestinian refugees the option of attending Syrian schools or UNRWA schools as compulsory education in Syria. They do provide uh, free health care and education where it is needed. And everywhere in the economy, Palestinians uh, have the opportunity and, in fact, are found in many and varied uh, jobs, from high managerial posts to professional work such as dentists, doctors, uh, to being uh, in hotels working as uh, uh, bell boys. Uh, so they they uh, they are very secure in Syria. Live in much better housing. It would almost seem like a, a residential area rather than a camp. Uh, and yet the um, Palestinians there, while acknowledging Syrian uh, uh, Syrian uh, cooperation and help, uh, still insist on having their legal right to return recognized as they do, of course, in Lebanon. But I particularly wanted people to see the people and uh, the, the refugees in Lebanon because they're the forgotten people. These refugees are the forgotten people. And why is that? That's because they're, for number two, first, number one, the Israelis have a vested interest in trying to make the refugee issue go away. I mean, they didn't, they didn't basically expel Palestinians in uh, the 40s um, and, and in order to try to let them return. They were transforming the demographics at that time, uh, which uh, in 1917 was 90% indigenous Palestinian Arab and 10% uh, or less um, uh, Jews who were both indigenous and also who migrated from Europe. Uh, and in order to have a Jewish state, you cannot have that large population. Well, that took place uh, uh, before and during the 1948 war uh, when Israel conquered 78% uh, of what was Palestine and called it Israel. Then in 67, they captured the rest of it and uh, West Bank and Gaza. And in the West Bank and Gaza, there were refugees from the earlier 78 percent, uh, and they're in camps. And now, and they're also what are called internal refugees in Israel, people who have been displaced from their original homes and not allowed to return, but who live inside Israel. Now, the focus on what's happening in uh, Palestine, I mean, the cruelty of the, the Sharon uh, administration, the demolition, has caught public, uh, has caught the public eye. Uh, but the the problem is that um, the Israelis do not um, do not focus on these people as uh, being uh, refugees. For example, Gaza is ninety percent refugees. In the West Bank is thirty percent refugees. And as you know, the Israeli government, any time there are uh, what I call bogus uh, negotiations, never intended to be implemented, uh, and always, um, uh, in a sense, uh, destroyed by Israel even though they try to blame the Palestinians for that. The right of return is the key issue. The right of return is something the Israelis do not want to see happen. Uh, they do not want to recognize it. They do not want to admit to expulsions, because to do so would, for many 
uh, make Israelis feel that they were illegitimate. Uh, and the point is that Israel is now established and the issue is, is moot. Uh, but the, the Palestinians do have, under international law, the right of return. They want it recognized for two very specific reasons. One is that it restores their dignity, that they were not the cause of the problem, that they were the victims uh, of the, the transformation of Palestine into Israel. Uh, that is number one. Number two, it would entitle them to full restitution for their loss of property and their suffering, just as Jews got after the Holocaust from Germany. Also, even though the media here seems to be ignoring it, it might not be too much of a uh, riddle for the people in the Middle East to see a connection between Israel's actions in the occupied territories and the American occupation of Iraq. Oh, it's as uh, it's uh, clear as uh, anything. They also know that the um, Israelis uh, had a, a special area in which they trained Americans in urban guerrilla warfare, and there is some. Uh, strong evidence that the Israelis also uh, convince Americans that the best way to treat Arabs is to really torture them uh, because the Arabs only understand force. And uh, a lot of the techniques which are used, um, although torture techniques seem to have a kind of universal um, uh, universal set of principles, uh, many people uh, feel that the Israelis were very much uh, involved. And um, what Israel is seeking in Iraq uh, is and, and, and it was part of the whole neocon idea. And the neocons are very pro-Israeli. They have been very, uh, um, uh, very much involved in Israel in their earlier days. Is um, that uh, that having having defeated Iraq and presumably getting a pro-American government, that the the Palestinians would be so isolated that they would just sign on to anything the Israelis wanted and give up all their rights. Well, in fact, that has not happened, and the Israelis are upset about that, but they keep pushing in Iraq to keep the U.S. there, and there are various uh, uh, sort of front groups that uh, represent Israeli business interests uh, already operating in the area. In short, what the Israelis want is uh, to be uh, recognized by the Arab world without having to concede much of anything in Palestine. It's that, interesting. Uh, many commentators seem to have mm -hmm. pointed out in the past that Israel does not want a disciplined, nonviolent resistance from the Palestinians. That's correct. That uh, is correct, because any time they're moderate, Israel uh, provokes, uh, provokes them in some way and tries to get suicide bombers, which always give a bad name to Palestinians. But there has been a very active nonviolent movement in, in the occupied territories led by Mustafa Barouti and Hanan Ashrawi and others, and the international solidarity movement, uh, which is from outside, is part of that nonviolent movement since uh, the UN has been blocked by the U.S. from providing protection for the uh, Palestinians uh, in the occupied territories. And as you know, Rachel Corey was killed and Tom Hernan was, was killed, and, and many people have been hurt. So the Israelis now uh, don't allow uh, internationals into the occupied territories. What they do is they say, if they don't turn them away at the airport, is you have to apply to go to the occupied territories. You need at least five days, and most people don't have five days to twiddle their thumbs. Uh, and they turn away most people. They don't want media to see what's happening, uh, continuing to happen. And yet, uh, local media is, uh, uh, that is within the territories, Palestinian media, um, is getting out information about the continuous demolition of homes and the uh, fact that thousands of people are now